On April 3, 1982, 22-year-old Stephanie Roper's car broke down on her early morning drive home. It was the days before cell phones, so she did what any stranded driver would do. She waited for help. She had no doubt that a good Samaritan would spot her and offer to give her a ride back home. No one could have imagined that a broken down car would be the catalyst for her death. This is Monsters. Stephanie Roper was born on January 18, 1960 in Montgomery County, Maryland. She was the much-loved firstborn of what would become five children. Her father, Vincent, was a United States Naval officer who was often deployed for work. After a long stint living in London, the family returned to the U.S. and settled into a relatively affluent area in Prince George's County. Her mother, Roberta, had left college to follow Vincent on his deployments and she stayed home to raise the kids wherever they were located. When the family returned to the States, Roberta completed her degree and taught part-time at the local school. All in all, Stephanie's childhood and her family were perfectly average. Stephanie was known as a warm and chatty girl. She had no trouble making friends and she loved going to church. She was the leader of her youth group, and despite her outgoing nature, she also loved to spend time alone. She spent hours journaling her thoughts in her diary, but it was Stephanie's creativity that set her apart. Even as a child, she would use whatever she could get her hands on and make it into something beautiful. It was no surprise when she told her parents that she wanted to turn art into a career. At 18, she enrolled with an art major at the Frostburg State College in West Maryland and headed away for higher education. In her senior year of college, Stephanie was able to share her creations at various exhibitions alongside other artists. In early 1982, she spent long hours preparing her pieces for an exhibition which was due to coincide with her graduation on the 30th of April. But before she graduated, Stephanie planned a short visit home for spring break. It was meant to be Stephanie's final visit home before she finished college and decided what to do next with her career. Stephanie stayed with her parents whenever she visited home. On Friday, April 2nd, she made plans to meet up with her childhood best friend, Lisa Thomas. Lisa had also been Stephanie's college roommate at one point, and the pair had stayed in touch despite years passing in the different cities they had both lived in. At the time Stephanie was visiting, Lisa was living with her parents in the suburb of Brandywine, which neighbored the suburb where the Ropers lived. Lisa and Stephanie decided to go out that night to celebrate Stephanie's graduation, which by then was just weeks away. The best nightlife in the area was in Georgetown, where the local university students hung out and where there was always good music and cheap drinks. That afternoon, Stephanie drove her car from her parents' place over to Lisa's house. The idea was to take Lisa's car into town so only one of them had to drive. Like most nights, they would drive back in the early hours of the next day. Stephanie let her mom know that she would sleep over at Lisa's and then come home the next morning. The pair planned to go shopping together and Stephanie didn't want to miss it. Initially, their plan went exactly as intended. They arrived in Georgetown and spent the evening at various bars, finally settling at Foggy Bottom, a popular college watering hole. They drank three or four drinks and danced until their legs couldn't take any more. Neither of the women was drunk, but by 2 a.m. they were tired and ready to head home. When they arrived back at Lisa's, Stephanie told her friend that it was probably easier if she went straight home rather than staying the night. She didn't want to oversleep and miss out on shopping with her mother and she could sleep longer if she was at home. Lisa suggested that her friend just stay, but it was clear that Stephanie had already made up her mind. They gave each other a warm hug and a kiss on the cheek and Stephanie drove off into the night. That was the last good moment in Stephanie's life. 
Stephanie headed straight home, driving her bright orange Dodge Omni. She took the most direct route, which included a country highway with no street lighting. Just half a mile into her journey, Stephanie lost control of the vehicle. She swerved off of the road into a shallow ditch where the car hit a stump. Although seemingly minor, the accident had in fact broken the rear axle and punctured two of the tires. There was no way Stephanie was going to be able to drive the rest of the way home in the vehicle. Stephanie got out of the car to examine the damage and without realizing what had happened underneath the vehicle, she tried to restart the car. She quickly accepted that she was definitely not getting out of there without help. She didn't worry though. Her bright orange paint job would surely stand out in the dark and someone was likely to spot her and offer to help. She told herself that whoever stopped would be able to take her back to Lisa's and she'd call her parents in the morning. But a good Samaritan wasn't in the cards for Stephanie that night. Instead, she got Jerry Lee Beatty and Jack Ronald Jones. Jerry was a 17-year-old unemployed high school dropout. He was a big guy with a heavy set waistline and tattoos snaking from his forearms up to his shoulders. Jack, on the other hand, was a married 26-year-old man who was also unemployed after being laid off from his maintenance job. He was a medium-sized guy, but he always looked unwell due to his pale complexion. Jack and Jerry lived together along with Jack's wife and their six-year-old son. Jack's brother-in-law, Stephen, was staying with them at the time as well. Jack and Jerry were unlikely friends given their age difference, but after meeting at a pool hall in Maryland, they decided they had quite a lot in common. Firstly, they liked to drink. Secondly, they liked to take drugs. And thirdly, they liked to combine both of those things and race around the rural streets of Prince George's County in Jack's Mercury car. The same night that Stephanie crashed her car, the pair had been playing pool at a tavern in Mechanicsville, which is a real town, not just a place that sounds like it should be in the animated movie Cars. After drinking their fill, they jumped into Jack's car and drove off to roam the streets. As they drove, they smoked a joint and added some PCP to the mix as well, because why not? It was in this way that they came across the damaged wreck of Stephanie's orange Omni at around 3 o'clock on the morning of April 3rd. Noticing that there was a person still in the car and that she was female, they decided to pull over and see what was going on. Make no mistake, these monsters weren't stopping to see how they could help. They were scoping out whether or not this was a situation they could take advantage of. After offering to help, they pushed the wreck off of the road and asked the young woman if there was anything else they could do for her. Stephanie told them she needed to get back to her friend Lisa's house, which was less than a mile away. The men happily obliged. Jerry got into the back with Stephanie while Jack got into the driver's seat, but then Jack changed his mind. He wanted all three of them in the front together, so Stephanie squeezed herself in between the two men. Initially, they appeared to be taking her to Lisa's house, but rather than slow down when she pointed out the driveway where they needed to stop, Jack sped up and drove right past it. That's when Stephanie realized she was in real danger. She shouted at the men to stop and to let her go, but these monsters had something else on their minds. After driving a few miles past Lisa's house, they pulled over on a deserted road and dragged Stephanie out of the car. Holding a gun to her head, they took turns raping her. When they were sufficiently satisfied and Stephanie had run out of energy to fight back, they shoved her into the car and drove back in the direction of Lisa's house. Once again, they drove straight past the place that would have been Stephanie's salvation. Less than an hour later, they pulled into the driveway of an abandoned house just one mile from where they both lived. The house was surrounded by thick, dark woods, and the men knew no one would be able to hear her screams. By then, Stephanie had recovered enough from the initial attack to start fighting back again. This spurred the men on, and they dragged her out of the car and into the house. Once inside, they took turns holding the gun to her head and raping her again and again. All the while, Stephanie begged for her life, and she fought like hell. She screamed out for Lisa, and she cried out for her mother. She begged for God to save her, and she prayed against hope that she would survive. It wasn't in Stephanie's nature to give up, and she was determined not to go down without a fight. She repeatedly tried to escape, and at one point, she managed to position herself at a good angle to knee Jerry in the groin. 
Jerry was furious, and he beat Stephanie even harder this time. First with his fists, and then with a thick logging chain he found outside. He hit her so hard on the head with the chain that her skull was fractured. But she wouldn't give up. Demonstrating her fighting spirit, when the men were huddled in the corner whispering, Stephanie managed to escape through a hole in the wall and run out into the woods. The men chased her and dragged her back into the house to rape and beat her again. This continued for hours. Raping, beating, raping, beating. When Stephanie wasn't being hit or raped or trying to escape, she was crying or holding her bleeding head and begging for her life. She asked Jerry if he was going to shoot her with the gun he kept threatening her with, but each time he would say no. But these aren't the kind of monsters whose word you can rely on. As horrific as this all was, it could have been stopped at any moment. But the point of no return came when Jack accidentally called Jerry by his name. In that moment, they recognized that if they let Stephanie go, she would be able to identify them both. Jack pulled Jerry aside and told him what they had to do next. Before the sun came up the next morning, one of the men held the gun to Stephanie's head and pulled the trigger, killing her instantly. Her pain and her life were over, but Stephanie's story was far from complete. The men went back to the mercury and began to siphon fuel from the tank. One of them claimed that they only planned on burning Stephanie's personal items, but no matter the intention, they returned to Stephanie's beaten and broken body and poured the gasoline all over her. Jack took a match from his pocket, lit it, and flicked it towards her. They both watched as her body went up in flames, but this was still not her final desecration. Even though she was burnt beyond recognition, they agreed that Stephanie might still be able to be identified, so they cut her hands off of her body. Then they dragged what was left of her to a stump hole which had filled with water creating a boggy swamp. They pushed her under the water and went off on their merry way, returning to the house they shared just a mile down the road. The next morning dawned bright and clear. Roberta Roper awoke and went about her morning as usual. She expected Stephanie back at any minute as they had plans to go shopping together. But when the morning turned into the afternoon with no word from her daughter, she began to worry. Lisa and Stephanie often stayed at each other's houses, but her daughter was a responsible girl, and if she had decided to stay on longer at Lisa's, she would have called. Roberta picked up the phone and called Lisa, but Lisa told Roberta that Stephanie had left in the early hours of the morning. After hanging up the phone, Roberta immediately called the police and reported her daughter missing. Hours later, Stephanie's parents' worry turned into all-out panic when her disabled car was found with no sign of her in or around it. Meanwhile, Jerry couldn't keep his mouth shut about what he had done. Just one night after killing Stephanie, he told Jack's brother-in-law that Jack, quote, had done a very bad crime the other night. He went on to tell Stephen in detail about raping a girl, shooting her in the head, and burning her body by the abandoned house down the road. Stephen doubted Jerry's story, and he told himself that Jack just didn't seem like the type. Plus, he knew both Jack and Jerry had a taste for drugs, so they were probably just high in telling stories. But the next day, when Stephen saw news reports about Stephanie going missing, he realized that what Jerry had told him could be true. Three days later, he decided to speak with someone about it. Stephen approached his pastor and shared what he had been told by Jerry. To his credit, the pastor advised him to go directly to the police. Using the information Stephen provided in his statement, police were able to narrow down the location of her remains. On Easter Sunday at 8 p.m., eight days after she was kidnapped, raped, beaten, and shot, Stephanie's body was found. At 4.30 a.m. on Monday morning, officers knocked on the door of the Roper household to inform Stephanie's parents that she was dead. Rather than go into the gruesome details of the condition her body had been found in, they simply told her parents that she had been shot. By the time officials informed Stephanie's family of her death, Jerry had already been arrested at his brother's home. By the next morning, they also arrested Jack at the home he shared with his wife mere yards from where the men had dumped Stephanie's body. Both men were charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, and rape. 
To the investigator's surprise, when the men were told about their charges, they both confessed. There was no remorse in their voices, and one of the arresting officers later commented that, quote, they talked about it much the same way that you or I might talk about deer hunting. When the car that the men had used in the abduction was searched, officers found marijuana, PCP, and a box of 22 caliber bullets, which were a match to the ones that had sealed Stephanie's fate. With the evidence, the body, and the confessions, there was no doubt that Jack and Jerry were responsible for Stephanie's abduction, torture, rape, and murder. All that remained was for them to be tried, convicted, and sentenced. But there's another altogether more disturbing layer to this story. As if losing Stephanie in such horrific circumstances wasn't enough, the Roper family were re-traumatized by how the events of the investigation and the trial unfolded. First, the officials who had informed the family of her murder had chosen not to share the specifics of what Stephanie had endured in her final hours. However, the media got a hold of the information from a press release made by the state attorney's office which revealed all of the horrific details of the crime. Just days after finding out that Stephanie had been murdered, her family learned exactly what had happened to her that night. Without warning, Roberta, Vincent, and Stephanie's four siblings watched as a news bulletin went through every graphic detail. One of the investigating officers later commented, quote, We fully intended to go back after the funeral and prepare them for the trial, where it was all going to come out. We didn't know they were going to release it. In the wake of Stephanie's murder, the Roper family were well supported by their community. About 50 friends and church members formed a tight group which made the funeral arrangements and provided moral support to the family. They also transported Roberta and Vincent to and from the courthouse to hear the various motions brought forward by the men's lawyers in the lead-up to their trials. It was at this time that the couple came to the realization that something wasn't right. They would turn up at the courthouse, which was an hour and a half drive from their home, only to find out that the date or the venue for the hearing had been changed. This happened over and over again. Each time they weren't notified, and when they questioned it, they were told that there was no provision or requirement in the law for them to be informed about proceedings, and no one was going to advocate on their behalf. In other words, the prosecution's goal was to advocate for the rights of society as a whole, not on behalf of the victim or their family. In September of 1982, five months after Stephanie's death, Jack's trial began. Roberta and Vincent were determined to attend every day of testimony, no matter how hard they knew it would be to listen to the details of what their child had gone through. But in a shocking decision, the judge who was presiding over the trial banned the entire Roper family from being allowed inside the courtroom during the proceedings. Because Roberta and Vincent had been called as witnesses to identify some of Stephanie's belongings, he ruled that they weren't allowed to hear any of the other witnesses or testimony presented for either of the prosecution or the defense. Jack's lawyer had successfully argued that their testimony would be influenced if they were allowed to sit through the proceedings. There was just one problem with his argument. Neither parent was a key witness. They were merely giving background on Stephanie's life and the items that belonged to her, not on the details of her murder. What was really going on was that Jack's lawyer didn't want the court to feel any emotion towards Stephanie. He didn't want her to be seen as a person, but rather just a piece of evidence that he could present differently to attempt to influence the jury's decision in his client's favor. So every day of the trial, Roberta and Vincent were forced to sit outside of the courtroom while the evidence of their daughter's murder was presented. It's important to remember that both Jack and Jerry had admitted they were involved in Stephanie's torture and murder. The trial wasn't much about determining if they were involved, rather it was about to what extent they were involved seeing as the crimes involved two people. Unsurprisingly, each man pointed the finger at the other. Jerry testified against Jack and made him out to be the instigator of the whole series of events. He said it was never his intention to kill Stephanie and he thought they were going to let her go. He claimed to have believed she would be let go right up until the time Jack pulled the trigger. 
Testimony of police witnesses, forensic psychiatrists, and the medical examiner were brutally graphic. They described finding her partially submerged and burned body, as well as detailing every one of the injuries found on Stephanie's body. There was no doubt that her final hours were filled with pain and suffering. Given the evidence and the confession, it was no surprise that after 10 hours of deliberation, the jury found Jack guilty of kidnapping, rape, and murder. But shockingly, they made one concession in their finding. They gave the judge the option of allowing whatever sentence he handed down to be able to be served concurrently rather than consecutively. Effectively, whatever years of imprisonment Jack would get on the multiple counts he was found guilty of could all be run at the same time rather than back to back. And here's where Jack's lawyer's strategy against the Roper family paid off. A week after the conviction, the jury reconvened to decide whether Jack should face the death penalty. They only had to find that Stephanie's death involved one of ten aggravating factors under Maryland law to apply the death penalty. The circumstances of Stephanie's death actually involved two of these factors. First, that she was murdered during a rape, and also that she was murdered while being held hostage. They also had to consider whether there were any mitigating factors that would mean Jack should not get the death penalty. This phase of the proceedings is usually where the court hears victim impact statements presented by family and friends of the victim. Under Maryland law, these statements are legally allowed, but not required. Given that Roberta had been excluded from the proceedings thus far, this was her first and final opportunity to convince the jury to see her daughter for the bright, beautiful, and caring human being she was. It was her chance to share how deeply Stephanie's murder had affected her family and to express how knowing that her daughter had died in such agony would always haunt her. After weeks of writing and rewriting, Roberta was summoned to the stand to read her statement. But the second she sat down, Jack's lawyer objected to her giving a statement at all. He stood at the bench and stated that all human life was of equal value and that laying out the particulars of Stephanie's life would only inflame the jurors' emotions and be unfairly prejudicial to the defense. We all know that every person, whether guilty or innocent, deserves to be given a fair trial and a fair defense. But Jack had admitted to what he had done, and had been found guilty of it and was now being sentenced. Roberta's statement was about the impact of her daughter's death, not whether Jack had done it. The jury had already found him guilty, so how is it fair that the hearing about the sentence would be more about him than about the victim and the crime he had committed? It's called an impact statement for a reason. It's for the victim and or their family to explain how the crime has impacted them. Astonishingly, the judge agreed with Jack's lawyer's motion to exclude Stephanie's family yet again and he told Roberta to step down from the stand. He ruled that her victim impact statement was irrelevant. In Roberta's own words, quote, The perception was that I was an emotional mother that wanted revenge. Yeah, I'm not seeing a problem with that. At the same time, I question why the jury needed someone to paint Stephanie in a positive light. She was kidnapped, raped, tortured, and killed. Was there some reason the jury believed that Stephanie deserved that? Jack met the requirements for the death penalty and admitted guilt. Case closed. On the other hand, the particulars of Jack's life were presented extensively in his defense against the death penalty. Witness after witness told of his troubled childhood, his alcohol issues, his cooperation with investigators, and his remorse. In a sign of his desperation, the only time Jack took the stand was during the sentencing phase. He was allowed to share how the murder had affected him. Let me make this clear. Jack got to tell the jury how his crime affected himself. But Stephanie's mother wasn't allowed to explain how her daughter's murder affected her. You can't make this shit up. On the stand, Jack said he felt deep remorse and he couldn't understand, quote, why something like this could happen. Uh, you're the person who knows the answer to that. You did it. Then he cried and told the jury how his mother was very upset about what had happened and she was very concerned about his life. Get the fuck out of here. But wait, it's not over yet. 
This case feels like the worst kind of murder killer game show where the only prize is more agony and pain for the victim's family. The most despicable claim that Jack's lawyer presented to get him off the hook from the death penalty was that his execution would cause lifelong anguish for his family. Oh, you mean like the kind of lifelong anguish that he inflicted upon Stephanie's family when he abducted her, raped her, beat her, shot her, cut her hands off, burned her, and dumped her in a pool of water? And she was innocent. Jack's lawyer won out again when the jury voted no to the death penalty. They cited how Jack wasn't a danger to the community and how he had a traumatic family history and now he was expressing a love for the Lord. They literally cited religion as a reason he should get a lighter sentence. The same judge that ruled against the Roper family so many times was also the one to determine the sentence for Jack. He sentenced Jack to life in prison for murder, life for rape, and 20 years for kidnapping. That wouldn't be so bad except he set them as concurrent sentences, meaning they all ran at the same time. Not back to back, just like the jury had given him the option of. Effectively, he sentenced Jack to one life term. With time discounted from his sentence for good behavior, Jack could be up for parole in 11 and a half years. Eleven and a half years for a case so brutal it was considered for the death penalty. But this wasn't just a case of one dodgy judge. Jerry's trial had gone down in another county under a different judge. He pleaded guilty to the charges against him and he received the exact same sentence as Jack. Eleven and a half years with his sentence running concurrently. Tragically, a local woman testified in Jack's trial that she had driven past the scene of the accident when Stephanie was still in her car. Because it was dark and so late at night, she couldn't see into the car so she decided not to stop and see if the driver needed help. If she had, Stephanie might still be alive today. To this day, neither Jack or Jerry has admitted any responsibility for severing Stephanie's hands from her body. The grossly inadequate sentences triggered a public outcry. Protests were held and the news media ran the story. Both judges were ripped into on talk shows and in newspapers with a conservative law lobby even demanding a review of their conduct on the bench. People simply couldn't believe that these monsters could be free in little over 10 years after having carried out one of the most gruesome murders of the decade. A petition against the sentence gained more than 90,000 signatures in a little over two months. The original prosecution team were also disgusted at the sentencing and decided to file further charges against both men. Luckily, these charges were presided over by a different judge and each of the men ended up with another life term on top of their original sentence. This time, the terms were to be served consecutively to their initial sentences. This extended the possibility of a parole hearing from 11 and a half years to 23 years. The further sentences were a win, but many people agreed that that should have been the ruling in the first place. With all of the media and stories surrounding the trials and sentencing, the same group that had rallied around the Roper family in the days and weeks after Stephanie's murder decided that their work wasn't done yet. By then, they had grown from 50 people to more than 1,000, and they named themselves the Stephanie Roper Committee. They jumped into action. Their battle cry was the few simple words Stephanie had written in her journal just weeks before her murder. Quote, One person can make a difference, and every person should try. The group enlisted the help of a lawyer who drafted a proposal which was to be presented at the Maryland General Assembly in 1983. In it, they made five requests that they hoped would be written into law to protect the rights of victims and their families and remove the focus of the judicial system from the perpetrator. Eliminate voluntary drug and alcohol intoxication as a mitigation of criminal intent. Require that capital crime convictions carry either the death penalty or life imprisonment without parole. Establish the right of the victim or members of the victim's family to submit a victim impact statement and to address the court during a sentencing hearing. Require that the death penalty statute be expanded so that co-conspirators in a capital crime can be held liable. 
changed the name Parole Commission to Inmate Review Board and require the governor's approval for all paroles. In January of 1983, Roberta gave a rousing speech where more than 1,000 supporters waited outside the assembly where the proposal was being presented. She said, quote, We have all been made victims by the judicial system that failed Stephanie and every member of society. We have come here to tell our legislature that we will not tolerate unjust justice. We are not looking for vengeance, but we must be the voice and presence of the victims who cannot be here. We want to make parole something that is earned in an extraordinary case, not a right. We will make sure that something good comes out of this tragedy. The sadness is that for Stephanie and those of us who have suffered, the price we have paid will be too high. Please remember what Stephanie wrote in her journal, that one person can make a difference and every person should try. We have been victimized twice, first by the acts against our daughter and then by a judicial system that made a travesty of justice. We are committed to being the voice of victims. Our motive is justice. All of the requests in the proposal sound fair and reasonable and it's hard to imagine anyone not being supportive of meaningful justice for victims. Roberta also had a simple request for there to be a liaison dedicated to keeping the victim's family informed about proceedings and any changes to dates or venues. So it was surprising, to say the least, when a barrage of criticism was rained down from officials, lawyers, judges, and politicians across the state and the country. There were comments like, quote, Emotion should stay out of the courtroom. Or one judge who commented, quote, To what end are they emoting? Is it to influence a judge's sentence? If so, I take great umbrage. Is it to make them feel better? Well, I suggest it's not the function of the criminal justice system to make victims feel better. Ultimately, three of the five Roper bills were signed into law in May of 1983. The first was in regard to eliminating alcohol or drug intoxication as a mitigating circumstance in capital crimes. It is now the law in Maryland that if a person takes alcohol or drugs of their own free will, then they alone are responsible for any crime they commit while under the influence. The second was an increase in the minimum sentence for cases where the death penalty could apply. This was increased from 15 to 25 years. In Jack and Jerry's case, this would have meant that the number of years before they became eligible for parole would have been 19 and a half rather than 11 and a half years, even counting for good behavior. The third and most critical for the Roper family was establishing the right for the victim's family to submit a victim impact statement in court. Previously, it had been allowed, but it wasn't enforceable, which is how Jack's lawyer had barred Roberta from giving one in the sentencing phase of his trial. These days, the rights of families to provide impact statements at sentencing are written into law in almost every state. Families are entitled to be consulted about plea bargains, and they must be notified of any hearing that is related to the case of their family member. And perhaps most importantly, they have the right to be present during the trial. In the years after Stephanie's death, the Stephanie Roper Committee formalized into an organization which is now called the Maryland Crime Victim Resource Center. Roberta and Vincent ran the organization together until Vincent passed away in 2013 at the age of 79. The organization's purpose is to support families who are the victims of crime while also lobbying for the final two requests of the original proposal to be established into law. When she was running the organization, Roberta spent much of her time in Maryland's state capital, Annapolis, meeting with legislators to enact these laws. In more recent years, the MCVRC have also picked up the fight for establishing legislation against stalkers and online bullies. At the time of the sentencing, Roberta and Vincent were criticized by death penalty abolishment advocates for apparently wanting their daughter's killers to die. They were forced to comment to say that their intention in the initial uprising against the sentences was not to have Jack or Jerry sentenced to death, but rather to have them given sentences which were relative to the crimes they had committed. Eleven and a half years just felt manifestly unjust, and they weren't the only ones who thought that. When the death penalty conversation became a distraction from what they were trying to achieve and as the result of the divisive publicity, the organization decided to no longer have a public stance on the death penalty. 
In 2012, it was revealed that Jerry had a personal profile on three prison pen pal sites, voiceforinmates.com, goodprisoner.com, which seems like an oxymoron, and writeaprisoner.com. His profile states, quote, I really am asking for a second chance. My family has either died or left me after 25 years of imprisonment. I need finances for attorneys, art supplies, and some everyday essentials. In 2012, the governor of Maryland renamed a section of Maryland Route 4 the Stephanie Roper Highway. He announced that this was in respect to both Stephanie and her parents' fights for the victims of violence in the state. There's also a gallery in Stephanie's name at Frostburg State University where she was just weeks away from graduating with honors at the time of her death. While their advocacy work helps them to focus on a positive outcome from Stephanie's death, the Roper family continues to struggle with her loss. Losing their firstborn child is horrific enough without the added insult of how they were treated in the fight for justice in her name. Roberta later shared how the trial and sentencing affected her children. She said, quote, I had kids who rejected friends, rejected God, school, the works, rejected their country. I had a daughter who ran away for a while, who didn't even want to be an American. I had a son who wouldn't pledge allegiance to the flag in high school. And this didn't go on for just a month or a year. I mean, they're doing fine today, and I'm proud of them all but they're still recovering their lives. I can't prove this to you, it's just a parent's belief. But I think the kids looked at Stephanie and thought, well, here's a sister who lived her life the right way, who excelled in practically everything she did. A beautiful person, a wonderful artist, an outstanding student, an athlete, a born leader who cared about people. And I think they looked at her and thought, what good did it all do? Did her life matter in this system of ours? No. What mattered most were the rights of the people who destroyed her. What she meant to say were the monsters who destroyed her. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.